You may be seated. I want to take my thought right out of the middle of that verse where the writer said, The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And tonight, for a few moments, I'd like just to preach on that thought, a heart after God's. A heart after God's. We've heard that scripture a lot in our life, and especially attributed to David, King David. And uh, uh, it's been referenced to many times. But I got to thinking, and, and here is the basis for what I'm going to preach to you tonight is that what kind of heart is a heart that's after God's heart? What does that, what does that compile of? What are the attributes that go into that? That God would say, I'm going to seek somebody, and I'm going to find or appoint somebody whose heart is after mine. My second question is this. Was David the only one that could qualify for that position? Or can we qualify for that position? Can we possess the attributes that it could be said of you and I that we have a heart that longs after doing the will of God's heart? These are legitimate questions. These are things that we want to think about. I think a lot of times we allow ourselves to be bound by humanism. I believe the spirit of humanism is strong in the church world today. I believe that the gospel in itself has been watered down by man, not by God. Don't you understand the gospel hasn't changed? From its very inception to now, it has weathered the storm. It is still intact, and it is still in its authority. But what we've got to understand, man, throughout the generations, has always taken the gospel to make the gospel applicable to their generation rather than applying their generation to the gospel. Right? I'll say it this way, that we've always wanted to find the time, find the place, find the way to make this way of the cross easier for you and I. Make it easier for our children. I don't want my children to struggle like I had to struggle. I don't want my children to go through what I had to go through. But what are you keeping them from? Because they're going to go through the trials in life. They're going to go through the troubles and tribulations of the world. They're going to go through things that you can't shade them from in the world. Why do we want to shade them from the things of God? Why do we want to shape them from the truth, from the reality, from the holiness, from the purity of who God is? Why do we want to make it easier to be a Christian? The world's not making it easier on you, are they? The enemy is ramping up everything he's doing. And why in the world would we want to keep our children, keep ourselves from being that person that can be a difference maker on the battlefield for God. We find here that Saul has been the king, I think for about two years now, if I understand it right, in this particular section of the Bible. And we find that he had been dispatched to go and take care of Agag, but he didn't. Okay? And he brought him back. And God had rent the kingdom from him because God was displeased with his rebellion. And therefore, God said, I'm going to find somebody else that will listen to what I say. Now, do you realize tonight how important it is for us to listen to the voice of God? There's a lot of hearing going on. But are we listening? Are we paying attention to what the Lord is saying to you and I? I told people myself a lot of times, so yeah, I hear you. But that was just my way of saying, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not really taking it to heart. Are we taking to heart the direction, the guidance of the Spirit of God that's telling us, make sure your lips are trimmed. Make sure your heart's right. Make sure your walk's right. Make sure you're going through this thing right. 
I was just thinking the other day, I, I, I was in a situation, a scenario, and, and wasn't quite sure how I was supposed to handle that situation. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And this, the simple answer from God was, you do the right thing. You do what's right. Don't sit there and think about what am I supposed to do. It don't matter where you are. You do the right thing. Amen? Amen. And so Saul didn't do the right thing because thought, Saul thought that what he would do would be better. I, I misspoke to you. I got my little things messed up there. Saul offered sacrifice. Before Samuel got there, Samuel was talking, taking his time, and Saul had offered sacrifice. But God had ripped, ripped the kingdom from him, and he asked Samuel to stay and honor him for the people that he may worship the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And we understand that God allowed Saul to be king for 20 more years after this. What does that tell me? What jumps off the page to me is this. Is that God gave Saul a space to repent. And he didn't. He didn't take advantage of the opportunity because God didn't say, Saul, I'm going to cast you away from that forever. God didn't put an exclamation point on him because we find in the Bible many times where God said, that I'm going to punish Israel for this, or I'm going to cut Israel off for that, or Moses, I'm going to make a great nation of you because I'm going to uh, uh, destroy the children of Israel. God's prayer and mind would be changed because people repented and prayed, but Saul did not repent. Saul did not pray effectively for God to restore him. He allowed his rebellion, he allowed his stubbornness to grow worse and worse and worse. I always heard growing up that the longer you wait to serve Jesus, the harder it will be to surrender. Why? Because when we're young, our hearts, our minds are tender. We are easily influenced. But as we grow older, our minds become chaff, chafed. We are touched, affected by circumstances, situations, by words, by deeds, by actions. And those things come against us and it shapes a hardness in our heart where we don't like to trust nobody. Right? One of the things we find today lacking in this world today is the trust between people. People will look you in the eye and lie to you. People will look you in the eye and tell you anything you want to hear. But they are slow to do what they promise. Slow to do what they say they will do. And it's broken down the bonds of trust. And it's translated into the believer's life. It's why folks have such a hard time trusting Jesus Christ the Lord. Because they can't trust anybody else. There were seven intangibles about David. That we're going to look at tonight. That patterned him as a person after God's own heart. A boy in raising. He was anointed to be king long before he ever became king. David didn't go from the shepherd's field. David didn't go from the pasture to the throne room. To the king's throne. David had some growing up to do. But we find that God taught him. As he was little, how to excel when he was older. Mm -hmm. The first thing we look at tonight is the first attribute of David was his faith. David was a man of faith. We find that David, as a teenager, he exuded great faith in God when he went before a giant. When all the armies of Israel were scared to go before Goliath, we find that David said that there was no way that he was going to let this man defy the God of heaven. There was some way that David had known to come to know God out in that shepherd's field, out in that pasture, keeping 
no sheep. There was some way that David had developed a faith in God to know that the Lord would keep him. That it was not just a novice, but there was something about God. That if we'll go not in our own name, but go in the name of the Lord. That God will handle our giants. God will handle our situations. And we understand that David, as this young teenager, went out and Goliath declared to him, Boy, I'm going to feed you to the fowls of the air. And basically David responded to him and David said, You know what? You told me what you're going to do, but let me tell you what's going to happen. He said, You've come to me in your ferocity. You've tried to intimidate me. You've done everything in your power to make me run, but I'm not running because I didn't come in my own power. I came in the name of the Lord of hosts of the God which unified. Yeah. And today you're going to know that God is the God of heaven that's going to take you down. Won't you understand today? Your faith in God will kill your giants. Your faith in God will move those mountains. That faith in God, amen, will push those troubles back. That faith in God will cause you to be an overcomer if we'll just allow. The second thing we understand was David's trust in God. And David's trust in God was learned by his dodging, evading Saul. Saul was after David because Saul knew that God had put his spirit upon David. Saul knew that God had anointed David to be the next king. And so for Saul, amen, to lengthen his turn, he knew he had to kill David and do away with David. But God wasn't going to allow that. It wasn't easy on David. David had to do a lot of things. David had to pretend that he was he going crazy. David had to run. He had to put himself in bad situations. He was hungry. Uh, he was probably even destitute, if you will. But David learned how to trust God. And when David needed provision, God always give him what he needed you. Because God had promised, I'll be with you. God had promised. He told him, he said, I don't be with you, come with you. Right? And God said, but my hand shall not be against you. Thank you Lord. you got to learn to trust. Because the world's going to do what the world does, but God's going to do what he does. And you know what God does? He takes care of his own. When you learn the power of trust, when you learn the capacity of trust, hey, man, there's not anything that the enemy throws your way that your soul will say, God, you can handle this. You just got to get your hands off of it. Instead of wringing it around your hands nervously wondering what you're going to do, you take it to an altar of prayer and leave it at an altar of prayer and allow the Spirit of God to roll in His hands and He'll make your stone a pebble. And He'll make your pebble sand. And He'll disintegrate those problems in your life. But we got to trust Him. So faith, so trust. Those are two cornerstones of the Christian character. Faith and trust. That we've got to have. You mean if I have faith, if I have trust, I can have a heart that can start to be after God's heart? Sure you can. Because those things are paramount in our life. We cannot live for God if we don't believe in Him and we don't trust Him. The third thing we look at was the love that David had. You realize, once again, that everything that David went through because of Saul, he loved him. You realize that David would not lift his hand against Saul. And he was given opportunity to do away with Saul. He was given opportunity to kill Saul. But David's heart was smitten when he even cut a little bit of his garment off. Because he had raised his hand against God's anointed. God still had to take him down from the position of king. And God had him steal him in that position. 
And David's heart was smitten even though he knew he was going to be a future king. Because he lifted his hand against the city king and he repented of it. Because David loved his enemy as he loved himself. Isn't that one of the hardest things for you and I? The Bible tells us that we are to love them that despitefully use us. And it is so easy to carry and harbor ill will in your heart against people that you feel like have done you wrong. But that's the devil's ammunition against your soul. That's how the devil puts that weight in your heart that pulls you down to get you to harbor that ill will. Because we'll tell ourselves we're all right, but we're not right. Because there's something in our heart when that name is mentioned that our heart skips a beat and it brings those feelings. I want you to understand. If we're going to be the children of God, if we're going to be those true believers, we've got to empty our heart of ill will. We've got to empty our heart of hatred. It's an easy no. It's an easy no because I believe the heart loves to hate. I believe the heart loves to hate as good as it loves to love. But as a child of God, as identified, that's a 21st century word, isn't it? Identified. Because we've got everybody identified as everything. But we need some folks to identify as a true-blooded child of God. Amen. That we can say we've been down to the altar of God. And we have been honest with God and said, God, I've got problems with this individual. But I need you to help me that I want you to clear my heart of any contention. Yes, Lord. Yes, that means you got to be willing to help the enemy when the enemy needs help. Whether you want to or whether you don't. I'm just preaching the word of God to you tonight. These are not my words. This is the word of God. And I've had to deal with ill will. I've had to deal with ill feelings. I've had to deal with the feeling of wanting just to strike back. And God say, hold your peace. And you told me the other day that something was going on with her and she was praying. And, and there were things that were happening. And God spoke her heart and she said, listen, and God said, listen, I know the rest of the story. I know what happened on the other side, but I know your side too. I want you to understand that you don't have to explain yourself to God. He already knows. He's already searched your heart. He already knows the intention of your heart. He already knows, amen, what you want to do with it. And the best thing to do with it is give it to him and let him bear it. Amen. Get that hate out of your heart. Get that hate out of your heart and say, God, help me to love my neighbor as myself. You don't want people to hate you, so you and I. Hate's a killer. Hate's a separator. Hate's a divider. But David loved Saul. Even though Saul desired to kill him, David loved Saul. David looked at himself as Saul's son-in-law. And he looked at himself as a poor, insignificant person that was unworthy to be the king's son-in-law. This is love. For God. What was the old song that said? If you don't love your neighbor. You can't love God. Or you don't love God. How about that? Y'all ain't saying nothing. You can't hear. Oh okay. They, they said I can't hear them. That's true. I'm about dead for one ear. You can't hear out the other. Bless him, Lord. But isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Jesus said it to this extent. If you can't love your neighbor, who you have seen? How about the love of the Father in you that you haven't seen? Mm -hmm. That one hits home, don't it? Yeah. It does. Because there's people in your life that rub you wrong. 
These personalities are just great your nerves. Wouldn't say amen and let the Lord love you for telling the truth. Amen. Yes, yes. There are people that pull out every wrong emotion in you. Yep. yep. And that heart says, mm, I can't stand it. Amen or all me. Amen. Amen. But God said. If you're going to be mine, you got to wash that heart. you got to wash that heart. The next thing we look at that David had was his integrity. It's the fifth thing, his integrity. You know what your integrity is all about? Your integrity defines your character. And integrity is lacking today in our society. I know I, I've been off the uh, salesman's path now for 24, since then for seven years. I've been off the salesman's path. But what I learned being a salesman, and most of what I learned is about what I learned in preaching. A lot of it I learned the hard way. I didn't have nobody saying, son, do this, son, do that, son, if you'll do this, and son, if you'll do that. I went to the school of hard knocks. I went to the school of theology. I had to pray a lot. I had to learn a lot. I had to eat a lot of crow in my life. I had to do a lot of humbling myself in my life. Because it was the only way I could do what God wanted me to do. But what I learned is that honesty always works. And I translated that into my DNA as a salesman. I wouldn't tell people something they wanted to hear just because they wanted to hear it. Now, in the tire business, I'll tell you this. When I was in the tire business, they just said they'd rather you lie to them than tell them the truth. It really had. They'd rather you lie to them than tell them the truth because they'd have something to cuss at you about. I'm just being honest. Something to rip about. Something to let their frustration go. But what I learned is I just told them the truth. If I messed up, I told them I messed up. I'm going to look at you and say, now that's the truth. Now what you going to do with that? I took everything out of it. Brother Lack, I mean, you know, there ain't nothing left to do but say it's my fault. Now I'm going to do my best to fix it. Because I messed up. When the company messed up, when my, my, my staff messed up and they didn't do the right things and I got that call and had to hold the phone about right here. I didn't worry about who shot John. That wasn't my concern. My concern was getting John off the floor. Mm-hmm. What are you saying, Brother David? It was fixing. Just making it better. Taking the sting out of it. All right, we made a mistake, but I'm going to drop what I'm doing and I'm going to fix it for you right now because I'm going to save your face to your customer. I'm not going to make you lose that sale. I'm not going to put you in a bad position. I'm going to stop what I'm doing and I'm going to go fix this right now. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I wanted my word to mean something. I wanted when I told somebody something, I wanted them to know that, hey, I'm going to do it. I walked in a customer's office one day. And I was sitting in his conference room, waiting on him to come in. And I looked at his sign, looked at his whiteboard, his grease board. And there was a saying on that grease board that I've never forgotten. It's burned in my memory. And it simply said, there ain't no traffic on the extra mile. Mm -hmm. Amen. There ain't no, what does that mean? There ain't no traffic on the extra mile. It means a lot of people have quit trying. That they don't do anything extra. They just do make some kind of feeble effort and they leave it alone. They won't give their best to it, whatever it requires. But the Bible teaches us that we ought to be the ones that feel that extra mile. And integrity is the very thing that drives you, amen, to go that extra mile for your brother. I mean, when somebody's hungry, you don't look at them and say, be fool. I mean, just because you look at them and say, be fool, it doesn't mean that their stomach's going to 
going to, the hunger pains are going to go away. There's something tangible that has to happen. There's an action that has to happen that takes effort from you or me that says, you know what? Here you go. Go eat something. I've done it many times, giving people money. I've done it, I've done it, bought people gas. Sometimes I put the gas in their car so I know it wouldn't go anywhere else. I remember I was at the Exxon station there in Lumberton beside the interstate one day and this girl, she was on, um, she was on drugs. What is it, uh, Myth. She was on drugs. Talking about she needed gas and all this stuff. And so I put some gas in her car. I put this one when gas was three dollars a gallon. But I put her some gas in her car. Right. And I put the nozzle up and she peeked around that pump and she looked at me in a snarly way and she said, What do you think? I'm gonna say thank you or nothing. So I just looked down and said nothing. And she drove on off. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying I did something because I felt compelled in my heart to do it. I went and did something that cost me. It didn't cost her a thing. But it cost me. Because something needed to be done for these people in the world today that needs to know that the law of God is real. That the law of God is tangible. That I'm not going to lie to somebody and tell them, I ain't got no money in my pocket when I got money in my pocket. Yeah. And it's hard to separate, I don't care if you're a Christian or a sinner, it's hard to separate people from their money. Because they're making an instantaneous judgment right there. No, you're just going to use it for this, that, and the other. Right. Mm -hmm. But God didn't call you to be the judge, did He? Nope. 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 God didn't call you to be the one. Sometimes God puts people in your way, unseemly people in your way. Sometimes God puts them in your path to test and see what kind of person you'll be when you really help those that are in need. Are you going to turn them what they're going to do with it? Come on for you. You see, we're supposed to be people of integrity. Yeah. That we're going to do the right thing. Regardless. I had a fellow met me in the food line parking lot one day. And he said, hey bud, I'm hungry. He said, I've been eating them pecans under that pecan tree. And he said, I'm homeless, I don't have nowhere to go. And he said, I'm hungry and I'm tired of eating pecans. He said, can I have some money? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll take you to the Chinese restaurant and I'll buy you some food. I said, come on. And we went over there to the Chinese restaurant, Lung Wa, Wing Wa, over there, Ming Moon, yeah. Over there beside the food line, on 41. Right. And I went there and they had hot wings on special. And I said, you want some hot wings? He said, no, 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 that's not what's done. So I bought him some regular ones. Make sure he got his wings in. He ate his wings. I was up at the Shell Station there at Lowe's one morning, early in the morning. I was up there about 5.30 in the morning cutting grass. That same guy come by and came up on the hunger. I said, I just bought you supper the other day. Oh, look, there's a lot of hurting people out there. There's a lot of people that are in unfortunate situations. Some of them are because of their own actions, and some of them they didn't have a choice in. But God's got people like you and I yes. that He has blessed. Yes. I'm not saying that you're going to empty out your pockets and give everything you got. But I'm saying, where's the spirit of charity? Where is our integrity as people of God? That we'll take a chance on God. That we do something good for someone. That somewhere along the way, God can use what you do to touch that heart. It may not touch it right then. 
But the Spirit of God has a way of moving on people to remind them of things that have happened in their life. And it's not always bad things. God can remind them of good things. So David had integrity. David was an upstanding guy because David sinned and he owned up to his sin. Mm -hmm. Did he? He did. Did he not own up to his sin? I want you to understand today, folks, that God, amen, can make you and I people, amen, that possess that desire to be after the heart of God. But there's a responsibility that comes with it. Amen. That we have to impose upon ourselves. Amen. That allows the Lord to move and work in us. The sixth thing that we see is that David had the ability to forgive. How many of you have ever held a grudge in your life? Go ahead and raise your hand and let the Lord love you. I want to see. How many of you ever had? Some of you ain't never held a grudge in your life. How'd you know, Lord? Probably some of us holding grudges now. Help us. <laughs> Brother David, I ain't holding no grudges. You sure? You see, those are the things that we have to search our heart of because we can easily convince ourselves of the things we're not doing when we're doing them. Yeah. Bless you, God. But David had the capacity to forgive. One of the greatest attributes a person has is that they can forgive. I want you to understand how the, you know, we look at this thing and it comes to our life. Forgiveness is one of those things that requires a short-term memory. Help us, Lord. That you just have to push those things out of your mind that the enemy would put upon you. You don't have to forgive them. It's hard to forgive people. People do hurtful things to you. People say some mean things sometimes. In a tense situation. There are times in your life when you lose control and you say things you wouldn't normally say. And then we justify it because we say we're mad. So you're telling me the Spirit of God can't guide our heart when we're mad? The Spirit of God can't hold my tongue when I'm mad? The Spirit of God can't control my spirit when I'm mad? There has to be an ability of the Spirit of God to temper you and I. Amen. That in our times we're distressed and we're angry and we're frustrated. That we need to be mindful that every word that we say carries weight. Yes. Help us, Lord, right there. Yes. Every phrase that we give has a potential arrow on it that pierces the soul. And David had this capacity to forgive. He had this capacity to look at it and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that I have done. I'm sorry for Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I lied to the prophet. I'm sorry, God, for my misgivings. That's what made David a great man. Not only did he ask for forgiveness, but he had the capacity to forgive. Do we like to be forgiven? How many of you like people that hold grudges against you and be mad at you? You want people not to like you? No, we want everybody to like us, don't we? But that thing goes the same. The thing has another way to it. That we have to allow ourselves to forgive. And to forgive. The third, the seventh thing we look at is worship. David loved to worship God. Where are we today? Where are we in the church age today? What I find in the church age today that worship has become commercialized. Worship has become proliferated with the capacity of the word 
world's concept of what worship should be. Right? We got to get the atmosphere right. It's got to be exciting. It's got to be captivating. It's got to be something that stimulates my senses. It's got to be something that stirs me. What's the concept of worship today? And therefore, we got all kinds of things going on. Now, I'll just tell you right now, I'm not a smoke machine guy in the house of God. If you're doing a play, I can tolerate it if you're doing a play. I'm not a disco ball guy. I'm not a strobe light guy. I don't need those things to set my atmosphere for worship. And what I would tell you for this is that that the Holy Ghost is more powerful. Yes, he is. That the Holy Ghost has the ability to stimulate us to worship him when we just love him. Amen. Yes, sir. Isn't that what it is? Mm-hmm. When you hear me praying with you, what do you hear me exhorting you to do? Love him. Yep. Worship him. Just let God be God in you. Don't seek the feeling, seek God. Amen. We're not chasing feelings here. We're chasing faith. We're acting on faith. Yes. Sir. Goosebumps don't give me power. Right. It is the moving of the Spirit of God in my soul that changes things. Yes. Worship is powerful. And worship of the Lord's heaven. And worship brings the Spirit of God. But it's got to be worship that comes from our heart. Yes. It's got to be worship that is intense. Yes. It's got to be worship that is meaningful. How about looking, amen, to show somebody how good I praise God? I just want God to know I love Him. I want Jesus to know I love Him. I want Jesus to know I need Him. That if He don't come, I'm not going to make it happen. Spirit is there. And there's a difference 
that comes off of you. Because your mind is not fixed on me. Your mind is not fixed on the goings on. Your mind is fixed on the Lord. That you're not allowing the devil to distract you. And how many times has he distracted you? How many times has he kept you from getting what God had in store for you because we just simply would not lift our hand and worship Jesus Christ the Lord. We just simply said, I'm going to do it my way. Well, what if your way is not God's way? What if the way you want to do it ain't the way that God wants you to do it? What if God just wants you to be simply obedient? You know what's in the middle of that word obedience? It's a three letter word. D I E. The Lord wants you to die yourself that you can live to Him. That's what obedience is all about. The Lord, I'm just turning it all over to you. I'm taking it.
that was in the chapel, had his prayer cloth, prayer, prayer room laid out, and he was in there praying to his God. And Brother Matt said, I walked in, and he was in there, and so I walked back out. He said, I went back a few minutes later, he was still there. I walked back out. And he said, I saw him come out, so I went in there, and I was getting my heart and my mind prepared to just pray and worship God. And he said, all of a sudden, that very same man came back in there and rolled that prayer cloth out and started praying. He said, God, what in the world do you want me to do here? He said, worship me. Yeah. Just start praising me. So Brother Van said, I started singing. I just started singing to God. I just started worshiping God. I, I, he said, I sang with as much intensity as the other man was praying. I worshiped with as much intensity as the other man was praying. And he said, it wasn't just a minute. He said, I looked over there. He was rolling that prayer rug up and he was going somewhere else trying to find. I'm not seeing anything against the man, but I'm seeing this. If we'll worship God, God will give you a place to worship. say a thing to you tonight that's foreign to you. I didn't give you an aha moment tonight. You know why? Because the Lord's already revealed the path to us. Amen. We just got to be hungry and faithful enough to follow the path. Jesus is coming. Who are we going to affect? And how are we going to affect them? Are they going to see us in our thoughts? Or are they going to see Jesus Christ? Personally, I'd rather them see Jesus. Personally, I'd rather them experience for me a God that can keep me under control. been in a lot of situations in my life where I could have on my staff and I could have said a lot of things. But I choose not to. Why? And you stand up and I'll make sure I stop. Why? Because what I understand is this. When I blow my staff, I'm putting a bad mark on Jesus. You 
you listening to me? When I let that flesh take control, and I let that flesh stretch out, I'm undoing everything that I've worked so hard to accomplish for Jesus, bro. Because you know what? All their rivers had to fall. 